whenever you're new to digital rendering, the biggest problem you will have is how to design your rendering, how to create the materials correctly, and well, how do you even illuminate your objects? And honestly, from my experience, the easiest way to learn this is to study reference objects or photos. So here I have various photos from Braun products. For example, this coffee maker, the mixer, another mixer, and you saw the previous images were all on a colored backdrop. Here, the same object or product on a white background and a colored background. Two objects on a white with actually photoshopped shadows that look fake. And for example, here again, two objects, white background and a drop shadow. So why are those photos really good or useful? Well, there are two things you can learn from these photos. First, let's maybe take a look at the scene. Well, I see there's a shadow coming towards me. So there is actually a light behind the object. Plus, I can see where they place the lights inside the scene to illuminate everything. The nice thing about actual photography is you can't fake it. So if you have actual product photos, you really can see based on the highlights or light reflections where they put the light sources to. So for example, here we can see there's also a top light and a right and left light. In addition, it tells us maybe what type of a ground uh, material did they use. Here we have a slight reflection, same there or here. So that surface is slightly reflective. But um, we also can pay attention to how the materials look like. The clarity and the strength of a reflection, the color, the structure of a reflection, maybe an indicator for a surface structure if is the structure smooth or is there kind of like some sort of three-dimensional structure on it how does metal look like how does plastic look like how should actually glass look like so um, the worst thing is to do to spend time in front of a render program and try to make it right if you don't even know really how it has to look like and the easiest way is well to get references and study them and then simply um, for example rebuilding simple objects and then trying to recreate that exact photo just digitally in a render software. That teaches you actually the most because you can really see how things are placed, how they have to look, and you just imitate it. Okay, so let's get started. I rebuilt this basic coffee maker really quickly. So it has most of the design features in, and I would like to get ready with the rendering. So I will create myself a new screen, which means a new interface. You don't have to do this one. I simply show you uh, that we can actually customize our interface nicely when, for example, you want to switch between a modeling and a rendering environment. So I know I will need lots of space for my notes. I don't need that much for my properties. I want to have a 3D view. I want to have a camera view and maybe down here uh, or maybe there I will keep, um, maybe I will do it this way actually. I will keep, uh, no, I will put it to here actually. I will keep uh, a reference photo. Okay, and you see now I can switch between the different viewports. Really nice, and eh, not viewports. Um, yeah, scene interface layouts, if you want to call it that way. So here I will load that reference photo we have there. Because this really helps now when I do a rendering, I can always compare. And then I adjust my lighting. 
my scene settings, my materials, till my rendering starts somewhat to match my photo. Easiest way to learn it. So let's actually set the world to zero because I would like to have a, a blank or black uh, environment first and then we will place lights. So in front view, I will place my camera, move my camera to here, uh, adjust it. This camera maybe should be maybe 55 millimeter. You notice that I adjusted my, my rendering resolution. So for example, it matches a little bit the format of my camera. So like proportion, eh, not camera, my, my product proportion wise. And then control zero in this viewport, I can zoom in. I can scale the camera, it's just an icon. I don't really change the camera besides how big the icon is. And then maybe I can move this one in till it seems to, to frame the product nicely. And also with Shift B, you can see you can do what's called border rendering. So I will just limit the render engine to only render the small part inside my camera. So that's pretty good. Okay, let's maybe move this one to there and there. Okay, goody. Shift Z, and we should not see anything. So we see one, two, and three lights. The reflections are a dead giveaway. They also tell us the right light is very dim and the top and the left light seem to be stronger. Okay, so let's maybe create the first light. We will put this one on top. It's probably just a small plane like this. I don't really know the height right now, so I will just push it somewhere to there. Uh, another plane, this probably is a little bit stretched, R, Y, and 90 there. Uh, maybe move this one up, maybe scale this down a tick there, okay. And then shift D and I move it, move it over. Let's say there. Everything I do right now is very approximate. I have no idea how it will uh, affect my scene. I just, based on the number, try to recreate the amount of lights and possibly the position. So these lights do not have any, uh, or these mesh planes do not have any light emission right now. So I can select this plane, go to Object Properties, go to materials and say new. And then this diffuse, I delete and put in an emission. And there's a little bit of light. Okay, uh, I have to do something here first. Uh, hold on, I have forgot to reactivate one setting here. Okay, perfect. Let's do the same with the other light. So again, select the object, new, and then this we can replace with an admission. You can also select two nodes or multiple nodes, control C, go to this object, new, AA, delete everything, control V and paste it in. Perfect. So now you see we created a lighting environment where light comes from the right, left and the top. So let's play a little bit with the lights. So we move the lights very close. You see the strength gets much stronger. The further the lights are away, the dimmer it is. Also, for example, the smaller the light, the sharper or the more uh, point light if, uh, way the slide will work, the bigger the light, the diffuser uh, the slide source will be. This is, for example, very important for the shadows. Uh, 
So when the, the light area is very big, you get very soft shadows. But if your light source is very small, you get sharper shadows. And then the distance also can define um, how quickly the light's energy decreases and then how much it only illuminates your object. So if I bring this one, for example, just closer, you see only because I brought it closer, the right side of my coffee maker gets more light than the left side. I can also play around maybe a little bit with the position. You see now they, these light sources more or less illuminate just the back. If maybe they go to the side, I have a nice left and right illumination. The front part is grayish, makes it very easy to read the three-dimensional quality. If I move the light sources uniformly to here, at one point, this becomes evenly or so evenly illuminated that actually it will look simply flat, undesirable, and this is not really a very good lighting. So you also see that I do this kind of play around just with a grayscale object. So I have no materials applied. And that's actually not too bad because this teaches you a little bit about how your object might react to different um, light sources. So without the materials, I can understand already how my lights might actually impact or influence my object and then I can customize it or adjust it actually because we can see the reflection there I think this object has to be slightly slightly there maybe yeah okay so this is somewhat the way how I start and lighting wise let's say this is this is okay Good. Um, two things we want to do. So on purpose, I move this light actually in. And maybe this light actually, I would like not to show up in my rendering. So you can click an object. You go to the object properties. This is, for example, right light. And then we say, turn the visibility for the camera off. Same here, same there. And that actually means that the light is still there. It emits light into the scene. However, it will not show up inside the camera. So there's also diffuse and glossy and shadow. If we turn shadow off, this light object cannot cast a shadow. So let's see, where do we have a nice shadow? Maybe let's select this cup here, turn this one off. Now do we see if it casts any shadow? No, right now it doesn't. So maybe let's um, move this light to there. I'm not sure if, if we will be able to see this well. Now, nah, probably on the, when we actually add a ground plane and we have better drop shadows and we can uh, show this. But diffuse, for example, means the, the emission of this light material does not influence the diffuse material of my coffee maker, which means think about this as light. So this light right now does not show up in the camera. It does not emit any light. It only shows up in any glossy reflection. So where is this very useful? This is very useful if, for example, you just only want an, a light to emit light but not show up inside the reflection. You see here in actual photography, we can only place lights where they show up in a reflection, so where it is uh, okay to see them. And in case I would see a light in a reflection where I don't want it to be visible, then I, in real life I can't simply place the light there. But in our case, we can simply put a light so it illuminates an object and say, but don't show up in glossy reflections. At the same time, if my lighting is perfect, I just want more reflections, I could also add objects, 
like light objects and then say only show up in the glossy reflection so they don't add more light to the scene they simply will show up in any reflective surface okay so at this point um, maybe we can add a ground plane there so um, you see now based on the reflection on the ground I might have to move my my lights away a little bit so a little bit further away uh, yeah maybe for the moment this is okay and this ground plane I have to move down to zero there okay good this is a very basic plane and that's fine there's one thing left we should do to our um, light sources you see actually that each light source emits light to each direction because it's a flat surface and we only want it to emit light into one direction so what we will do simply is add a mixer there and then we would like to, to tell the software well pick one surface of um, my object let's say here the back facing and the back facing for example should be black so see this is front knob this is back because we say the back facing and if I flip this now you can see the back of my object is black and there it emits the light because we can we can select one mesh and give each side actually a different material that's the way how um, you mix between two different materials by using the geometry as the mixing factor so we can do the same actually to the other mesh there paste it in there uh, oh I might have to rotate actually this object so let's go into local okay so there yeah and let's select that top light control V there uh, and for example there Z so probably this one uh, no this one okay because it goes the other direction okay perfect so obviously these two objects I also don't want to show up inside my rendering great so I only see actually how they affect my ground plane um, which also means I will get some some light patterns on the ground so there I might even have to move these lights a little bit further away okay good so this is our first decent grayscale image and now it's time to work on the material for this coffee maker let's start now with creating our materials and this reference photo again will be insanely helpful to get started and then really fine-tune the color and the reflection the way we want so let's maybe start with the plastic and select any object here new and maybe call this one plastic orange I could click on this color and click eyedropper and even maybe sample the color from this object or try to mix something myself so if you have for example uh, reference colors or Panton colors you could load a Panton swap and then sample the RGB value and 
yeah so for the moment this is okay maybe you and you these are all plastic parts in orange and you shift click this one which has the material control l to make links to that material there and i forgot this one there control l okay there's also a small surface inside and plastic orange there good now this is a matte surface so it's diffuse it has no reflectivity so i need to add some reflectivity to it so shift a shader glossy this is smooth so there's no structure to it mixer and mix these two together okay well now we can mix between only diffuse or um, mainly diffuse and 36 percent glossy mixed over it or for example glossy 77 percent mixed over it or 100 percent glossy so think about these two materials as a and b and here these two shader inputs are a and b so i mix a and b together based on what however i design the factor for example with the lights we mixed a and b based on the gym geometry the front and the back face but we know that reflections with plastic are not very uh how could i say that um they're not the same on a, a geometry that is perpendicular to the camera contrasted to geometry that is tangent to the camera we know that actually everything that's perpendicular has less reflection and when it goes to tangent surfaces the reflection gets stronger and also more saturating but it doesn't really saturate or overlay and hide the diffuse by the way also a different way to understand or think about this we're doing a layering so this is my let's say my primer on my car and the glossy is then the clear coat we put on top so a plus b and then the only thing is based on how the node system works everything's like a plus b it just goes down instead of going upwards like in photoshop all the layers are going upwards so the top layer hides all the layers below and here all the the top layer is actually below and not on top so it's just reverse or think about a plus b so i would like to include my layer weight with a blend of 0.2 and put this into the mixer and then now we can immediately see that the reflections are not as strong for example if i go to 0.2 there now i get the same strength but they're still very uniform and here you can easily see that at these edges the the reflection uh, is weaker than to there because to the outside the reflection will get stronger okay so this actually tells us already if we compare maybe the dimensions of the reflection this uh, light source is too small so we have to scale this one up looks like those are bigger than in my rendering so maybe local space syy make this bigger same here syy there well, not too bad there's also something happening right here at the rim so i assume there's maybe somewhere another smaller light and i will hide all these lights for the moment so i can just perfectly focus only on this light to see what i could do to maybe help this the problem is if i put it to the back hmm, i get a reflection on the ground so maybe i put this one really far away so i it just shows up on the reflection or here is a little trick i simply say don't emit light just 
give me the result of the reflection. So this is actually what I meant with painting with reflections and then using other um, other lights to illuminate your scene. In real life, we can't really do this, but uh, in computer graphics, this is not a problem. So now th this reflection is too strong. Point one, point three. Yeah, this is a little bit better. This light is too weak. Oh, they share the same light. Ah, uh, yeah, you see that? That's the reason why my front light changed. So, because I made a copy of that object that made a copy of the material, and that's not what I want. So, left light, this is right light, and this is left reflection there. And now, this one we can go back to maybe two. Ah, uh, too strong, 1.5. Mm, yeah, maybe leave it there for the moment. What do we have here? A one. Yeah, uh, maybe 0.75 for the moment. Okay, good. What do we have up here? 0.1. Let's see what happens when we make this really white. Yeah. Hmm. Maybe moving it in, moving it to there. Try to figure out maybe how they how they place and rotated this light so I get the same result. Oh, actually, it, it's not even angled. It is just going straight down. You can see the way how these two things touch. And you see also here in the reflection, the lights nearly touch, which means um, they're, they're actually up there. So it's a typical light box. Okay, uh, maybe like this. can actually move this one down and shift or S and then Z to scale only along the Z axis. Okay, maybe like this. There. Also here on the right side I need the small uh, reflection helper there so we rotate this one and again to see this better and maybe I turn this one off whoops not hiding that one G there okay perfect good so that wasn't too difficult let's work with the glass so can also add the materials here and change this to glass. This for example is let's say metal. So it should be maybe diff glossy but it is a little bit reflective and maybe here I would like to use this version of glossy that makes the reflection of the metal a tick uh, darker, more blackish, which is what I want. So this metal band here should be metal there. Okay. Now this will be plastic and black. Could actually go to the to this one here and select all this. Control C, go back to the handle, delete this one, control V paste this in and then make this a black material. But we do not make this 100% black, but we increase this a little bit because there's no material in the world that is 100% black. Now we see a little bit of clear reflection here, but in inside the reference object, we can see it's very diffuse. So 0.1 maybe, what about 0.2? Uh, point 0.1 roughness. Okay, so this roughness simulates um, that the surface is slightly structured by simply blurring the reflection. And there is a clear reflection on it, so this is too blurry. Uh, huh. 
Oh, why doesn't it show up there right now? So let's see. Uh, we use this one. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. I think the reason why it doesn't show up is because... Hold on one second. So... Uh, this is all clear. Okay. So, hmm, I don't really see currently my uh, my light source and the reflection. I try to see maybe where I have to put it to so it shows up. So I have to get this one very close and down. Okay, so now I see where it roughly is. And when I move this one away, oh, interesting. Hmm. Yeah, this might be an issue actually. Well, we'll deal with this actually at a later point. Maybe we just have to simply uh, artificially move it down and then there, yeah, it overlaps. Okay, but for, for the moment, this is, this is okay. Good, so this metal part does actually the reflection correctly. It is just too uniform, so 0.1. So I can see there where the black plastic part attaches, it is a little bit blurring the reflections. Good, okay. Now this part and this part, oops. These three plastic parts share the same material like this handle, control L material, and there. And there is actually this button and the brown logo. Let's make it the same. And we also have those feet here. Control L link to material, so I'll make a copy to it. Good. You see I have those buttons here and they're actually cut out the space out of the, how could I say that, the, the orange part. So if I want, I could simply turn off all these functions. So they are still there inside my scene. So I always see them. If I have to move something, I have everything on one layer, but inside rendering, it will not be used for the calculation, so you don't see it. And I can turn it onto wire, so here I can also see that there is an object that I used to create some sort of a Boolean operation. Okay, so we're, we're close to um, having this rebuild. So let's see what else we maybe could do. Um, there's a backdrop, as we can see. So let's make a backdrop. And maybe e uh, move this one up. There we now have a very basic wall. Maybe to there. This edge, I will actually wait with a bevel. And then I will select all these edges and shift E and crease. Now when I add a bevel modifier, I could say use the weight, one centimeter. Now I can define how big at the end, it for example arcs, and maybe how many steps, maybe 16. This whole object should look smooth. And yeah, so what do we have? Maybe zoom, let's zoom out for a moment because I see some shadows that are happening and my objects that create a light reflection are casting shadows, nothing I want. So I select these objects and say, also don't cast shadows. And now they don't interfere with my backdrop. And there. So they show up in the rendering on the reflection, but they don't affect the rest of my scene.
pretty nice. The scene is a little bit darker than here, so maybe I could go to the world and say there's a little bit of background light, maybe 0.1, maybe 0.015, yeah, maybe like this, not too bad. But colors are maybe not correct, so let's go back to our object and see how maybe we can work with the color. So there's too much red actually. I could either click and drag around here. I could also go to uh, the red slider and for example, slide this one. But the problem is you see it also adjusts the the brightness. So when we go to HSV, we can just slide the hue. So now I really switched through just the colors. That's pretty nice actually. So the value for the brightness is the same. And I can even work with the saturation. See the saturation goes from nearly no color to full saturated. No, this is actually pretty close there. Yeah, maybe let's leave it this way. Okay, so, but there's still something missing. This scene is kind of mm, dull. There is kind of like a gray film over it. This looks much, much better. So um, we can go to the scene and we do a color adjustment. So this is something we only do here. You don't really want to do this in uh, in Photoshop for this reason that while in rendering we have more color information to process and to work with and when uh, you render this save into JPEG and go into Photoshop you have less colors already so the color correction you do in Photoshop will be not as good as when we do it right natively inside the render engine and that is not something that's unique to Blender that's uh, a general practice as well so when we go to color management, we could go and, for example, work with the exposure. Maybe make this a little bit brighter. What about gamma? There, so everybody who works in photography knows a little bit about what I'm doing right now. And look at that, pretty close. So I nicely adjusted the colors that pop much better. Um, let's see if, what else we have. We can also work with curves if you want to do this. So maybe all the darks a little bit darker and all the brights a little bit brighter and more saturated. But mm, yeah, I have to be careful with this. But also here you see this adjustment helps really well. Maybe just a bell like this. And there, so you see just minimal adjustments have a huge impact. So we can also work with the curves. And the third thing we could work with are so-called um, kind of camera film simulations. So the two I work with a lot are, for example, uh, where is it, this one. And it's just simulating how this image would look like when being shot with a certain film. So this is the raw rendering. This is like very dull and very grayish. And just by selecting, for example, this film, you see it, it gets a nice brilliance. Okay, so if let's say we add more light, 0.3, 0.2, 0 0.3, yeah, oh, this, is, this is getting slightly to where we want. The light sources are not as strong, so now I can select the light source here and say, well, actually, this one can be stronger, so two, mm, 1.5 maybe, yeah. And then I add a lot of light, so maybe my environment light, I can tone down a tick. Yeah, see so, you now I get the, the same or similar contrast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
not too bad. This ground plane, let's say we would like to have a slight reflectivity. So we give this a material, floor, and currently this is just a basic diffuse. So when we want to show a reflection, we have to add a glossy, and then we also have to mix between these two. Maybe make this clean. And there now you can see the reflection of that co uh, the coffee maker on the, the bottom part. Again, also here we can change and work with this to tone it down. So for example, there is a little bit of a reflection, but not as much. We can also blur that reflection a tick. Mm, too much. No, still too much there. So you kind of can see that something is happening. But also the reflection would be on the back and maybe that's not really what I want. So similar with the plastic, we can add a layer weight and then we override, for example, how the reflection works. And I took the diffuse material out because I only want to see you know, how the glossy value will work when, for example, I turn the blend value to zero or if I set it to one. Now you can see even the vertical face of my backdrop has a reflectivity value. And if I s lower this one at one point, only the ground plane, for example, is a little bit reflective, but not really the backdrop which is very good because now this only reflects the object and the backdrop only shows the color from my diffuse and has no, let's say, uh, reflectivity added to it. What happens if we copy maybe this color? Ooh. Maybe bring this up a little bit there. And after a little bit more rendering, we will end up with this. Uh, it doesn't look too bad. The problem is if we compare this with our reference object or image, you will see the reference object has a whitish ground plane. And then to the back, the backdrop actually blends up into a different color. Hmm. So how do we fix this? Well, number one, we can create in Photoshop a gradient texture with a white to this yeah, grayish turquoise color and then map it onto this plane. But the problem is when I do it in Photoshop, I have no idea how it will fit onto the plane, meaning how it will end up or look uh, on my rendering. I could then go back into Photoshop and adjust it, save it, and then do another test rendering. And it's very complicated, lots of redundant, repetitive works and you guess a lot. And actually, it's much better if we simply do this right inside the render software. And again, what I do here in Blender right now is pretty much common practice with all render engines anyway. So there is a gradient, so I need a gradient texture. Let's take a look what we have. Texture, gradient, there. Let's add color to there and maybe zoom out, let's rotate. And there you see now the gradient texture adds a texture black and white by default from the left to the right. Hmm. Not really what I want. I want a different color transition and then it should be rotated 90 degrees. So we know how to UV unwrap. So um, we can, for example, select everything, say U unwrap and leave this and take a look nothing happened okay so what happens if we rotate actually the uv also nothing happens so this is interesting well the thing is the gradient just has no a default left to right uh, gradient but we don't really tell it maybe what coordinate system it should use and when we UV unwrap this mesh, we create a custom UNV or X and Y orientation. 
and that we can feed into the vector. So we can simply now add textures, coronet, UV, and feed it in. And let's see now what happens when we rotate this one 90 degrees. And look at that. You see now we changed the orientation actually of that blend. If, for example, I go 45, then we even have a diagonal. So hmm, this is not not too bad. Maybe let's go go to there. Yeah. Uh, okay. So scale this one up a tick. And I would like actually to have now a white to this turquoise gray color blend. So between gradient and diffuse, I need to add a color mixing. You see, sometimes we mix different materials with the shader mixer. We can also mix colors with a color mixer. And that is here under color mix RGB. This goes into the factor again. So the gradient texture basically provides us with a gradient. And with this gradient, we can blend between two different colors. And there we are. So this, for example, should be our white foreground. Uh, okay, uh, did I miss? Oh, <laughs> wrong color mode in there. And this blue is actually the back. So I can drag this one onto the blue there. Okay, let's press zero to go into the camera and let's take a look. Oh, this is already much better. You see actually how this is white and then it blends into this color. Not too bad. But right where my mouse is, there is kind of like a shadow line. If I zoom out, you can see this lines up with my backdrop where it starts to curl up. And also here in the shading, you can see that there are some uh, shadows. So let's maybe take a look at the bevel modifier. If I make this transition smoother, uh, but I still maintain it. So in this case, if I want to have something like here, I need to have a really big and soft continuous arc. So this doesn't really work well. So I can turn this one off. You notice I still have these outer edges uh, sharpened or creased, shift E1. And let's add a subdivision surface modifier. So maybe go to three. And there you see now how nice and smooth the color transition is because the object continuously bends. The problem is right now it cuts through our object. Not very good. So we need to add some loop cuts. So maybe one there and put it after the coffee maker. Let's take a look from a side. Yeah, okay. Well, this seems to be good. Maybe this one we bring back a little bit more. This also means gets further away from light sources, so it will get a little bit darker. Yeah, this is actually not too bad. So the trick here is really having a nice and long blend or arc. This one maybe we could stretch out a little bit more to make it even wider and smoother. Okay, so this gets very close. And um, I would like to actually have more white on the back. So how could we do this? So currently the gradient is basically a left side to the right side mix bet uh, between two colors. And then the way how we use it here, we use left and right to mix between these two colors and our custom UV um, unwrapping defines the orientation. But now I would like to change how and where these colors blend. So I need to have control over the gradient result, the gradient texture creates. 
So what I could do is, in this case, between gradient texture and mixer, I add a so-called color ramp. And you see this actually looks like a black and white gradient. So one side, the other side. And let me move out so you can see actually the effect really well. If I, for example, bring this very close together, there you can see now that how much of the the uh, material is black, how small is the transitional uh, area, and how much then I have the other color. And then with this, I can, for example, soften this up a little bit more. So you see we have a lot of the white material. And then actually it blends into this bluish material. So black and white are like markers on the surface. If, for example, I move everything to there and the white to there, so I go to the left side, which means in this case, the front. And you see the majority is bluish. Only a tiny part is white. So this way you can then easily override how the blend function works and how actually and where the, the colors are mixing. Okay, now this one seems to be a little bit annoying. Come on, let me click. Hmm, what's going on? Oh, I needed to click it first. Wah, wah. Just can't click and drag. Okay, press zero. Let's zoom in and let's try to fine tune this so that my rendering somewhat matches actually my reference photo. Ah, oh, now we're getting close. Yeah. Okay, maybe like this. This could maybe get a little bit more saturation. So let's go to the HSV and increase saturation a tick. There, what do I have for white? Artificially, I will set this to one to brighten this white up a little bit more. And yeah, and maybe darken the top a tick like this okay perfect good so this way we made our custom backdrop with a color and all this color information only feeds into the diffuse which generates the color for our material and then again the layer weight blends between diffuse and glossy and it's said that only the lower part is reflective and to the back we just see a diffuse material. So we're actually reaching nearly the end of uh, this demo. So what's still not correct here? The glass actually looks kind of grayish. Uh, so let's take a look. All the settings here are right. Let's click the color and oh yeah that's it. So Obviously, the darker I make the glass, the less clear the reflection will be. I want to have nice, clear reflections. So in that case, I need to have RGB set to one. And now you can see nicely through that object. However, you notice that there is a little bit of darkness. So this backdrop here behind the glass should look a tick darker. So. This can't be 100% white, maybe just a little bit there. And glass is also not always, uh, could I say that, color free. So it looks like there is maybe a little bit of bluish tint to it. So um, maybe go to there. So I just pick maybe the color. And then with the saturation, I can decide how colorful is this glass. And I just maybe a little bit there. Very minimal, oh, this is way too much. Maybe five, seven or nine. Yeah, maybe like this. Perfect, good. So that is fixed. 
and um, this plastic here is still not good so with the roughness we make the reflection look a little bit blurry giving you the feeling of oh, this is not a polished plastic there there are small uh, there's a small structure to it but actually when we zoom in we don't really see this structure so we have to actually create the structure so what we will use is a bump mapping so we go shift a vector and bump and this one we will feed for example into the normal and now this function basically will create fake highlights and shadows on a material to give you the illusion of a three-dimensional structure but we have nothing that's, that actually defines this three-dimensional structure and we can go to texture and for example work with the noise and maybe this factor we feed into height uh, we can work with the size to maybe scale it down strength is too big so maybe one oh, look at that let's zoom in a little bit and there you see already there's there's something happening so without it and with it so if you ask yourself what is normal think about normal well as a direction so we use this noise texture to create highlights and shadows uh, going into the surface and going away from the surface by using the normal because the surface goes into bends into different directions so all of these highlights and shadows have to flow the direction of the surface but there is a little issue you see the texture seems to be stretched and compressed there so not really ideal so what I will do is this shift D make myself a copy there and then I feed this one to there click on this output because I actually would like to see how this noise texture just looks on a plain material and there you can see that this is stretched there's nothing here that really helps me to stretch uh, de-stretch it and that's simply the, the basic mapping this function uses and it doesn't really work with my object so I have to override it so we go back texture uh, sorry input texture coordinate and say mm, object object properly should work there and yeah they're, they're really big so we might have to scale this one down 500 still too big 800 uh, maybe thousand and you see this pattern size wise is uniform and nicely flows around our object 1500 yeah okay so let's see how this will affect actually my reflection so i click on material output for this part and there now i see this pattern nicely and the size is way too big so maybe 2500 uh, that's still a little bit too big so maybe 3000 okay now well, this is getting better but maybe the effect is way way too strong so the strength here I can lower by 0 0.5 or 0 0.01 yeah there should just be something happening on the surface not too strong Let's zoom out a little bit maybe a tick more yeah maybe like this this doesn't look too bad okay so let's see what we have uh, only the last thing maybe the plastic the black is not as good and saturated as in the photo so let's see maybe whoops wrong direction A tick more down Yeah, maybe like this. Okay. 
So, what else do we have to fix? The light sources? Um, uh, maybe four. Too much. Maybe three. Okay, this one maybe a one. Let's see if we move this one to there, to there. Ah, you see now this light reflection is similar to the photo. So this gives me the feeling that maybe this light is actually just at the side and not rotated. Yeah. And that seems to be more the way. And also, I think it is wider. Yeah, okay. So um, let's take a look at here. This light, ah, it is actually too strong. It blows out too much light. Or maybe I have to adjust the color. This shouldn't be so saturated because the more saturated it is, the, uh, the brighter it will get. Hmm. Maybe let's go this way. Ah, there it is. Now a very bright color when it gets a lot of light will wash out very easily. And if it's a darker color, it will not wash out as easily when it's illuminated with light. Uh, tick, tick brighter. Yeah, maybe like this. And let's see what's happening with our reflection light here. There, maybe a one. Yeah, okay. Uh, maybe 0.75. Okay. Maybe to there. There's just a tiny rim highlight. Okay, nice. So this reflection on the plastic seems to be occupying too much. So maybe a point 0.1, let's see. Ah, there it is. Because if you say point 0.5, too reflective, point 0.1, less reflectivity. Okay, good, good, good. So only thing that's actually wrong uh, or different compared to the photo that's left is actually you see the metal ring how this is black and then I see the highlights there the reflection of the lights and this is really bright grayish and that's because this bright gray in the metal reflection is my grayish environment so that's a problem when you just use the the light of the world because it will make everything uniformly gray uh, when you have reflections. So I want this to be blackish. The easiest way to do this is simply, well, we will create a black object. Oh, this looks interesting. Kind of cut section of that coffee maker sticking out. Would be a nice animation. Here, look at me. Okay, uh, let's bring it back and um, give it a signal color so I can see maybe where it will show up. Uh, okay, this is blocking my view for my camera. So let's turn this off. Also diffuse shadow. I only want it to show up in reflections and let's get it closer. And oh, you see there now, it shows up there inside the reflection. Nice. So, um, Let's make this one nice and black. Uh, okay, uh, still shows a lot of gray there. So hmm, maybe I have to adjust the metal material. Let's click that metal. And for the moment, let's make this a zero because I want to see what it reflects. Ah, 
Ah, this actually might reflect the ground plane much more. You see here in the metal, you see the object, and then what you see here, I think, is more on the ground plane. Um, the camera is also at a much lower angle or a position, nearly parallel to the ground. You can see here how this looks nearly uh, a little bit more down, and here it's more like this. So let's see. Ah, oh, ha, ha, ha. There it is. There. Okay, good. Uh, that we figured out. Now, yuck. Way too much of my objects on the top, and I moved my camera down. But again, thank you to digital rendering, we also have something called a tilt shift. So I moved my camera down, but now I adjust what I see by using the shift command. Okay, can move this in a little bit more as well. There. G and Z. There. <laughs> Let's maybe go with a 75. Maybe a little bit further away. Oh, there. Now we're getting close to it. Awesome. Okay, perfect. So um, this object is really large. Also in the 3D view, it blocks my view. So I set this to a wire. I think I could scale this one down to something smaller. It just should be in front of my coffee maker. There and there, okay. Now let's make this one kind of like a dark black. Ooh, there. See, uh, very often you hear me say something. Um, I can see a bad rendering easily and how empty the reflections are. The reflections here are not empty. They are nicely uh, sculpted and filled. You see, this looks empty. This looks more interesting, but this black is a tick too strong, so I still have to make this mm, a little bit brighter there. And also the metal now is super polished, so 0 0.1, let's make it a little bit blurry, 0.25, yeah, like this, okay. I see a reflection here, um, what is... What's showing up there? Oh, it's that one, this piece. So this object shows up in the reflection. Ah, it makes sense because I moved it to there. So I have to move it out to there. What happens if I rotate it? Can I maybe make the reflection on my object smaller? Ah, there. Rotating it did the trick. Perfect. Okay, at this point, honestly, I don't know what else I could do to to improve this rendering. This seems to be pretty well imitated. 0 0.05, maybe more for the reflection. Uh, no, I meant 0 0.01, less glossy, uh, less blurriness for the reflection. Zero, mm, no, 0 0.01, that was good. This metal is, is very reflective. Let's go back to this one. Yeah. I could I could tone this reflection a little bit by driving the strength down, you see, by making the white reflective color more grayish. There. Yeah, okay. That seems to be good. Okay, at this point, yeah, I would say we're done. So to render this one out, I have my size set for how many pixels I need. I know, let's see, maybe how many uh, samples I need for 
the rendering 100 is not clean so maybe I set this to 500 and maybe I make a quick screenshot and uh, not screenshot render border for this area and let it render and then I observe at one point does everything look clean so mm, looks like maybe 300 samples okay what about here yeah huh? Uh, similar area. Also keep in mind a little bit of noise doesn't actually look bad. Feels a bit, little bit like actual historic film and also when you print that noise you might not see. So also here 300. So 300 samples for rendering. I do not want to render the border so I, I deactivate it. Let's save everything and then let's hit render and then based on what render mode uh, you selected if you can render with the gpu or if you use tiles you should see this one pop to uh, work off and you see this doesn't take too long So I let this actually render, then just pausing and, and restarting. So um, yeah, we can zoom in with one actually on the numpad. And we can see that it is a blurry reflection and there's a little bit of tiny structure on it. So nicely executed. The reflections are good. There are some, um, there's some noise in the reflection or artifacts that's because of my polygon model with a higher sub D. I would not see this actually. The metal looks pretty good. Yeah, there's actually nothing really to, to complain about in this rendering. Oh, <laughs> oh, it's happening up here. See the brown logo is kind of uh, kind of disappeared. So that's interesting. Let's see why this happened. Hmm. Ah, I have an idea. This, yeah, that's the reason. So I have view three and render two. So I'm nearly sure that was the reason for it. So how to fix the small thing? Well, I don't really want to re-render everything, obviously. So this image is good. I will go and save, save image as desktop and let's say brown one as PNG down here no compression uh, if you want to have good colors for Photoshop to adjust go with 16 otherwise just go with 8 because we do all the color adjustment directly in Blender save and now here for example I go to slot 2 and then Shift B in the camera, mark this, and this is all set to three. Okay, render. No, I just render border the small detail out. Perfect. So, uh, save image as, um, for example, logo. And here I can see that there are some artifacts. So maybe with three, this is four is better. So four, okay. Um, I will just render this part out. And then maybe slot three and render. So you can see that some of the tasks you would do in Photoshop, like with the blend material or so, we simply do right with the materials inside the 3D render software because you're first quicker and you're in more control and it's less work. How might mean you might have to learn how to use these nodes, obviously, but there's a huge advantage of better speed and more control. Okay, so all these parts are composed. 
So there are my different images. I could go now and open this one in Photoshop. Sorry, Adobe, I use Pixelmator, oh, which has an artifact today. Okay, now I still go back to Photoshop. Wah, wah. And open this image there. And then I can drag this one in and enter and drag this one in. Photoshop actually nicely places these um, small parts correctly at the right position. And then we can shift, e, uh, not shift E, control E or Apple E, merge the layers. And we fixed the rendering and we are done. And when we compare these two images, now the, the final rendering and actually the target, well, this one looks much blurrier because the image is smaller, so it's scaled up. Um, but you see, we actually got very, very close. Some of the colors are not 100% yet the same. So this is a little bit more orange. It looks like the metal uh, reflection here is more blurry in the image than in my design. Um, there's also something happening here in the lights. There you can see it. So something there is different. The light reflection on the glass is a tick stronger. But uh, those could also be adjustments done later after they took the photo. So it's always a little bit difficult to know how far was something done in the render engine and how far was something done in post-pro, so post-production, Photoshop or after rendering. Um, also, the lights have actually a little bit of a texture. You can see that there's something brighter at the center. Currently, we just created mesh lights with a uniform white illumination color, but I will show you how we can map uh, certain kind of like light box or diffuse box images on it so that even the, the reflection will look more in a way that you actually really have there some sort of uh, an actual light box. But you see that the process uh, to design this shot was not very difficult. One backdrop, a little bit of uh, a background lighting, one left, one right, and a top light, carefully paying attention to the materials and colors. Um, and this was all done just within an hour. So this is actually not very uh, complex. Plus, uh, this was a video tutorial. Uh, I would actually not need in that much of time to recreate this shot. So you see that uh, it didn't really took much, much time to create a rendering that is actually pretty close to the reference object. And uh, that's the reason why um, I'm not a very happy fan of other render softwares where basically they're done very easy. So you can make renderings very quickly because easy very often means you have no control. And um, yeah, well, that's not something you want to, to be limited by. Sometimes they're good if you have to make quick uh, kind of screenshot-like renderings, but for a final product presentation, you really want to have the right tool that gives you exactly the result you need. And like in our case, we needed to move the mesh lights, etc., around. And when you work with a program like Keyshot, that costs a grant. Um, yeah, well, I could say it's industrial standard, but it's kind of rendering for dummies, in my opinion, because it is very crippled with what it can do. And Blender, uh, gives you the same flexibility like 3D Max or Maya with much more control in designing a scene and rendering for actually zero dollars. And everything we learn here, again, I would like to repeat this, uh, will be applicable to every render software you might ever have to use because essentially it's all the same. So to bring this video to an end, I would like to show you now how we can with the same scene design quickly create different variations or different render styles. 
So currently I have a white um, backdrop with a gradient to the back. And let's say I would maybe like to have a high contrast or a black backdrop. Well, I could, for example, select this um, floor and I will not create a new material, but inside this material, I will create an, a secondary material definition. So diffuse and material output, shift D, make a copy, bring this one over. And then let's say this one we set to white, RGB and blue. And then nothing happens here, but the moment I click on output, you see cycles or blenders will use this material. If I click on this output, it uses this node setup. So this way you can simply have one material and inside the material you could have different material styles or variations. I find that much better than flooding um, my material list here with all the different variations. I simply have the variations in here. So this is, for example, now with a pure white background, but hmm, uh, this is actually grayish. And if we put this on a presentation board, then we have grayish backgrounds. Ugh. So what could we maybe do or change? Well, you might think, well, you know, if you want to blow out the, the shadows or so, Maybe we turn this into a light. What about this? Uh, but the problem is, yeah, it works. Um, but we have, it is, the whole background is pure white now. Um, and we have no, no ground plane, no drop shadow or so. Um, actually, this is the, one of the easiest way to make um, a quick knockout because you could easily uh, select the white and make it transparent or if because it is actually pure white in photoshop you want to print it you might not even really have to do it because the image already has a white background but if this one should be put onto a uh, let's say a colored uh, background in illustrator we would have to cut the white out but no this way the white is perfectly the same however we have no shadow so nope uh doesn't work so let's put this one back there. Could actually also lower this color. So for example, make it really dark. And then we have a really nice high contrast, mysterious um, looking rendering. The only problem is, as you can see, the glass now doesn't really work well because you need something bright behind the glass for it to show up. But you see, just by adjusting the backdrop colors, you get really nice, interesting results. And for example, we could uh, select these two, Shift D, and let's say, hey, this one should be really dark, but I want this glossy reflection there. There we have it. And there we have that the reflection, maybe in this case, because it is so noticeable, maybe a little bit more blurred. Oh, there. Ah, perfect. Ah, doesn't look too bad. But then again, that's an issue with you see nothing through the glass besides black. Okay, but you can keep this inside the same scene. So let's set this back to white. Let's click to here. There we have our white material. So it just mouse clicks, click, 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 different render styles. And that's the reason why I really like uh, to work this way in contrast to the way how some programs only allow you to work. Less options is always nice because it means less to learn, but it also means you can't do much with it. So I would like the white backdrop to, to knock out more. This is grayish and I don't want to have to clean this up in Photoshop. So what could we do? Well, we could go to the world and here we have a pure white. And this background note, I will click and say, this is for example, for my gradient 
plus black backdrop. Okay, so I know actually where I used this one for. Now I could shift D, make a copy. And this one, for example, we now call um, pure white background. Because what we'll do now is what happens when we set this to 0.5. You see, everything gets much brighter already because I'm f artificially flooding the scene. So when we go to the outside, you see how bright everything is. If I set this to one and you let it render, you see at one point you do not see the backdrop anymore because it has the same white color as our environment. Downside is everything also gets <laughs> much brighter, but it also looks like it's nicely shot in a really bright environment. And we could go ahead and maybe say mm, exposure, maybe a little bit lower, uh, no, or the gamma, let's see. Uh, we can bring a little bit of, of saturation and contrast back, yeah. Not bad. And take a look. There is a tiny, visible, perfect drop shadow. So no photoshopping. Honestly, Photoshop is good for to sometimes clean up small artifacts. But I follow with shadows the same like with bad photos. Uh, no matter your Photoshop skills, a bad photo will remain a bad photo. And uh, Every photo you paint by hand will never look as perfect and realistic as a rendered shadow. So, and this one now, for example, we could render out. I will pause for the moment because I quickly want to render out all these different views uh, and then we can compare them. So, renderings are done. Uh, let's take a look at what we have. So, uh, there and there. Yeah, so. Actually, it looks very interesting. So now you, there you can compare how the same model in different lighting environments looks different. The first two top also seem to have the same illumination on the white background because we pumped up the white environment color to one in generally is much brighter. But it is not yet really looking washed out. It lacks a little bit of contrast compared to to those. But again, you know, if you take a look at photos, um, you can see similar similar styles based on how you illuminate an object. You always will um, paint the three dimensional quality of that product differently. Um, but very often it's just the visual style that's also really very important. Uh, and this is still very, very easy to read. In those high contrast images, I pay actually a lot of attention to the highlights and reflections. Here I pay a little bit less on the reflections. Um, and you see they all have some, some ups and downs. The glass container, very easy to read. Glass container, <laughs> kind of really hard to read actually. Uh, this black area here is not the greatest to read. Also in this image, it you can see it, but it contrasts not perfectly well from the background. And here, this is actually pretty good. All the different black and gray values on the handle. If we go to white, this is probably not much different, but because um, of having a really bright white background, color contrast wise, your eyes perceive this also differently. So yeah, that is basically uh, rendering in a nutshell and how to use one object, a three key light system, backdrop, different materials and different background lighting settings to generate three different renderings out of the same object with a white background, uh, diffuse, drop shadow, and then a colored or black background with a glossy surface.